Hey, I'm Alex, this is Big Al Books, and I'm here today to do a top 10 author recommendation video. In Canada, June is recognized as National Aboriginal Month, so I wanted to make a video where I could share some of my favorite Indigenous authors, most of whom are working out of Canada today. So this is by no means a comprehensive list. There are so many other authors that I haven't even checked out yet, but out of the ones that I have read, these 10 are my favorite. They are all so incredible, so I'm hoping this video will be a great introduction. If you haven't read any fiction by First Nations, or Inuit writers, and if you have, hopefully there will be some new suggestions in this video. So let's get started. I'm going to start off this video talking about Richard Wagamese, an Ojibwe author from the Wabasimun First Nation in northwestern Ontario. He's the only author on this list who isn't currently alive. He unfortunately passed away a few months ago, which was such a loss. He started out his career as a journalist, so he's written some nonfiction and two memoirs, but he's also done some short stories and six novels as well. I've only read two of his books so far, but they both have been such emotional reading experiences. He is such a captivating writer who knows how to hit you right in the feels. The first of his books that I read was called Indian Horse. It's about a boy named Saul who gets sent to a residential school. And if you know anything about those places, you'll know that it is not a very pleasant experience. Although while Saul is away at school, he discovers the game of hockey and he realizes that he really likes hockey and that he's really good at it. So it's sort of his story as he progresses and becomes a better player. I am not a hockey fan, but Wagamese is such a stunning writer that he could make me, you know, who is such a big hater, even see the poetry in the game. And this book is just so captivating. I couldn't put it down. I think I stayed up until 4am in the morning to finish it because I just had to get through it. It's a very sad story, but it's very powerful and I would recommend this to anyone. I also really enjoyed his novel, Medicine Walk. It is a slow-paced, character-driven novel about a father-son relationship. And the father is this alcoholic deadbeat who has basically only disappointed his son throughout his life. But they go on this last trip together through the woods because the father knows that he's dying. And it's about their journey together. It's kind of one of those books where nothing really happens plot-wise, but you get to go so deep into these characters interiors and it's all about the stories that we tell ourselves and how these stories can shape us as people and this book was again so emotional it really had me bawling by the end so I would recommend both of these books. Next up is Maria Campbell, a Métis author from Saskatchewan. She's best known for her memoir called Half-Breed. This is a book that gets taught in a lot of Canadian universities. It is seen as this pivotal text and was a really eye-opening experience for a lot of Canadian readers because this is a book that is a vivid portrayal of Maria's upbringing as a Métis woman in Saskatchewan. And for the most part, that was a pretty difficult existence. I think for a lot of readers, the poverty Poverty that she describes in this novel is very shocking. Maria's family really did not have a lot of resources. She writes about what it was like to have to bring gophers to lunch for school and you can see how a lot of the Canadian settlers around her were pretty racist a lot of the time, especially the way that they called her people, the Métis people, half-breeds. I mean that's not great but she kind of grew up being embarrassed of who she was and where she came from and that went on to have problems for her later down the road. But she does also deal with some of the strengths of of her upbringing. Her family seemed very tight-knit and close. She writes about some of their traditions, some of her childhood memories, some Christmases that they had together, and in particular she had a very close relationship with her grandmother. So there are some really beautiful scenes in this memoir as well, but she does not dress anything up. It is very sparse. She tells it like it is, and it is an amazing book. I haven't read anything else by her, but I know that she's done a lot of work in theater. So the next place that I'm going to go for her is The Book of Jessica, A Theatrical Transformation, which she co-wrote with Linda Griffiths, and this is a play and the story of the making of this play. So I'm excited to continue on in my Maria Campbell journey. 
Thomas King comes from a Greek and a Cherokee background. He was born in the US, but he's lived in Canada for a long time, so he's considered to be a Canadian author as well. He's a very funny author and he's a great storyteller. I think a great place to start out with his work is this nonfiction book called The Inconvenient Indian, A Curious Account of Native People in North America, or as he wanted to call it, Pesky Redskins. So this is a very sarcastic and ironic take on a lot of indigenous settler relationships going back as far as Columbus. So it's a really accessible way to learn some history and have a laugh, even though a lot of the times he's making these jokes that you really feel bad about laughing at because they're about such horrible things, but this was a really engaging read that will get you thinking. I also enjoyed reading his book called Green Grass Running Water. It's about a company that wants to build a dam in this town in northern Alberta, and there is a guy who does not want to give up the rights to his land, and he wants to prevent the development from happening. And it also takes on creation myths, but in this very irreverent pop culture way, and it's a very creative novel with lots of intersecting characters, and it was a lot of fun. Katharina Vermet is the youngest writer on this list. She's a Métis author from Winnipeg, and she appeared on the scene with a collection of poetry called North End Love Songs. I haven't read that yet, but I probably should, because I was very impressed with her debut novel called The Break. This is a book about a family of women who come together in this time of crisis. So a young girl in the family attends a party and she gets attacked afterwards, and it's all about her family trying to work through this difficult time. Vermette uses multiple narrative perspectives to really draw you into the mind of her characters, and they always have more going on than just the, you know, major plot event. They are these richly formed characters, and even though the subject matter of this book can be difficult, for some reason it was also like an easy, enjoyable read, and I think that's the strength of her writing style. Like, it's just one of those books that you just want to keep turning the pages and just continue to live in that story. So I'm happy that Vermette got a lot of recognition this year. Her book was in the Canada Read shortlist and it was a fan favorite. I thought it was going to win the competition actually, but it got knocked out on day one, which let's not even get into that. But a lot of people re were reading this book and loving it this year and I'm very excited to see what Katharina Vermette is going to do next. Drew Hayden Taylor is an author that I have a kind of love-hate relationship with. I think that his works can be so funny and creative, but at the same time, his simplistic writing style can drive me nuts. But I keep returning back to his work anyway. So he's an Ojibwe author from the Curve Lake First Nation, and he's most famous for his plays, such as Toronto at Dreamers Rock. I've only read one of his plays and I wasn't that impressed with it. But I have really enjoyed his nonfiction. He has these collections of essays called Funny You Don't Look Like One, which refers to the way that some people don't think that Drew looks Ojibwe enough because he had a white dad and he takes after some of his dad's features even though he grew up not really knowing his dad and he grew up on the reserve with his Ojibwe mother. But he's kind of poking fun of those stereotypes that people have about First Nations people. So there are a lot of jabs in this book about ignorant Canadians and things that they think. So very funny essays. As well, I really enjoyed his novel called Motorcycles and Sweetgrass, which is about the Ojibwe trickster figure called Nanabush, who takes on a human form and goes to the Otter Lake Reserve and creates some chaos. Drew's never afraid to try something new in regards to genre. He has one book called The Night Wanderer, a native gothic story, and he has this collection of short stories called Tickets to Your Chief, which are labeled as classic sci-fi stories, but the contemporary First Nations outlook. So he's never really afraid to have fun and try something new. So that's what I enjoy about his fiction. Eden Robinson is from the Heisla and Hailtsuk First Nations in British Columbia, and she really impressed me with this book called Monkey Beach. It's about a girl named Lisa Marie, whose brother's gone missing, so there's this kind of dark mystery at the center of the book, but while she goes along the coast in her boat trying to find him, she is flashing back to her life. So it's also this very charming coming-of-age tale, and Lisa Marie is just such a sassy and sensational protagonist. Like, I just loved spending time with 
with her and reading about what her upbringing was like, especially growing up on the beautiful British Columbian coast. Sounds so idyllic. So this was a really fun book, even though she does go through some difficult times. I just really enjoyed the hell out of this thing. I need to read more Eden Robinson. I know she had a book that just dropped this year called Son of a Trickster. Have to get around to that one. She also has a collection of short stories called Trap Lines, and I also need to get to those ones soon because I think she is a fabulous writer. She infuses this Heisla mythology in her work, but they are also just a lot of fun. Thompson Highway is a Cree author from the Barren Lands First Nation, where his father was a world champion dog sled racer, so that's pretty cool. And just a few days ago, Thompson Highway was awarded an honorary degree from the University of Manitoba, which is cool to see him getting some recognition because he is a just great author. He's most well known for his two plays, The Red Sisters and Dry Lips on a Move to Kapuskasing. I haven't read this one, nor can I pronounce the name. But I have read The Red Sisters, and it was this cool play about these seven women living on this reserve, and they have these big dreams in their head that they want to go to the world's biggest bingo in Toronto, and they all have these different ideas about how they're going to win, and what they're going to do with the money, and how that's going to change their lives, and it was a really a funny play. I'd also highly recommend his novel Kiss of the Fur Queen. It's about two brothers that get sent away to a residential school, and like Saul, Indian Horse, they have some very bad experiences at this school, but they also have some joyful moments because they discover their passions while they're there. Both of the boys are very artistic. One of them becomes a concert pianist, the other one is a dancer, and they get a chance to further develop their interests while away at this school. So for them, trauma and passion are intertwined in this kind of unhealthy way, and you'll see how that affects them differently as they grow up. So this is just a very very beautiful novel. There is some poetic language in here. Thompson Highway incorporates the Cree language as well, so this is just a very beautiful book. Another awesome Cree writer is Tracy Lindbergh, who is from the Kelly Lake Cree Nation, and she teaches Indigenous law at the University of Ottawa, but she also dropped her debut novel a few years ago. This is a book called Birdie, and it's about a woman named Bernice, who is just in the state of total collapse. She has this complete physical, mental, spiritual breakdown, and the reader is just trying to piece together little bits of her life and try to figure out what happened to her and what is going to happen to her afterwards. So time is not linear in this novel. You really bounce around through different memories in Bertie's head. We see her as a shy and bookish child growing up in a very dysfunctional home environment and everything that happens to her afterwards. So it's a great adventure trying to piece together this woman's life, how she rebounds from trauma, and especially how she learns how to recover and pick herself back up and the use of family and culture and traditional knowledge. This is a very smartly written novel and it takes on some very difficult subject matter in a very creative writing style. Richard Van Kemp is a dog rib Dene author from Fort Smith in the Northwest Territories, and he has books for people of all ages. He has quite a few popular baby picture books, but I prefer some of his fiction aimed at an older audience. I really enjoyed his novel The Lesser Blessed. It's kind of a YA novel in that it's this story about these teenagers living in the Northwest Territories and deals with a lot of like the everyday of teenage life. You know, they have crushes and they go to parties, but at the same time, it's a lot darker than most YA novels. I mean, things get very twisted in this book. And our protagonist, Larry, is such an awkward guy, but he is also very mystical. You know, he talks to the crows. No one around him really understands him, but he made for a fascinating character, and it was a great book. My family actually lived in the Northwest Territories for a while, but I was a baby, so I don't remember. But when I read Richard Van Camp's works, it's always in the back of my mind, like, what would it have been like if I were one of these teenagers growing up in a place like this. So if you want to learn about what life in this part of the North is like, his books are very interesting portrayals of what goes on. I'm currently working my way through one of his short story collections called Night Moves. And again, 
all stories set in the Northwest Territories. Some really weird characters going on here. He deals a lot with these like criminal seedy underbelly types, but it has been a fascinating collection so far and always enjoyable experience with Richard Van Camp. The last person on this list is Lee Maracle, a Salish author from the Stolo Nation in British Columbia. I first encountered her through one of her poems called Blind Justice, and it really blew me away. It has this powerful refrain of, I am not tragic, because she is trying to fight the stereotypes that we see in the media every day about Indigenous people being broken, or victims, or powerless, and Lee Miracle really challenged challenges that in this poem and she wants to remind everyone of the sheer resilience of these people and these cultures and it is an awesome poem. But I hadn't read any of her novels until like this week. I finally picked up this book called Raven Song and like her poem, this also blew me away. It is so good. This is a book about a girl named Stacy who is living in this pretty traditional First Nations community in the Pacific Northwest, but she is also trying to advance her education by going to high school across the bridge in the white part of town. So she is really at this age where she's comparing what life is like in the white town versus what it's like in her village, and a lot of the comparisons were very cutting. So if you're a fragile white person, don't read this book, but they were really good observations. The people in Stacy's community go through a lot of hardships throughout the course of this book. There's a flu epidemic that's going throughout town and the villagers don't have access to the same proper health care or resources that white people in the other part of town do and they're experiencing a lot of loss during this epidemic and no one else outside of the village is seeming to care about it. And as well they have a fire, they have situations of domestic abuse, there's really a lot going Going on and Stacy is really just trying to figure out how she sees the world so this was just a powerful novel there is also the larger mythical characters of Raven and Cedar who are kind of watching the world watching all the drama unfold and they know where things are going in the future because ultimately there is going to be a collapse of this traditional way of life so it takes on a lot of heavy themes but at the same time it was just a really enjoyable read I totally enjoy Lee Miracle's writing style and right after I finished this I went and ordered two more of her books so can't wait to read more. So that is it for my top 10 favorite indigenous authors. I want to thank you so much for watching this video because I think that a lot of these authors don't get the mainstream recognition that they deserve. Like a lot of these authors you don't really hear get talked about much on booktube. So I want to thank you for taking the time to hear me ramble on about these amazing authors and I would love to further the conversation in the comments. If you have any recommendations for me, I would love to hear them and once again thanks for watching and see you next time